Hello, this is part two of week 11's lecture. So we're looking at museums this week. And um, if we look at the map that is on the screen here, this is an estimation of how many museums there are in the world today. In a way, this is our horizon. It is populated by museum. Museum has become a universal institution that we fall back on as a kind of space that narrates history to us that tells us something about the world. It is the space that narrates knowledge to us in a coherent way. And it is also encyclopedic in a way that it is something that is a, a global in nature. So this horizon has really long imperial roots. And over the course of the 19th century, uh, as European powers expanded their whole over different parts of the world, Essentially, what happened was they carved out most of the world into competing transregional networks uh, where formerly sovereign states now had to demonstrate loyalty to one of the competing European empires. So the museums we are most familiar with that continues to exist today originate from this moment uh, sometime in the late 19th century in Malaya and Borneo. Here, the conversation that drove much of the hybrid knowledge that we have explored in the previous lecture begin to give way. In its place, a much more authoritative system began to dictate uh, what knowledge was, uh, and this was seen through the lens of an imperial science, where over time, an increasingly rigid system of classifying and categorizing things that are in the world began to develop uh, in order to map out how we can know the world. Uh, so we know the world through its uh, ontology, its thinkness, right? Uh, what it's uh, considered as essential, its, un its fixed and unchanging nature. Uh, and classification lends itself to this kind of fixing uh, it also lends itself to a new kind of ambition uh, and hubris to know everything and everyone and every object in this world, every tree, every bird, every human. The museum, alongside with the map and the census, began to act with a certain authority uh, and it determined how we can know ourselves almost. Uh, on one level, uh, you have the professionalization of science and the staff then becomes a professional body of curators. They undertake excavations and expeditions, turning lost uh, uh, ancient customs, excavating ruins, and transforming them into a kind of spectacle of knowledge in the present day. So the museum also had a theatrical role in its display function. Uh, and through its display, what it does is also it produces a measurement of civilization, you know, uh, as a determining unit on a hierarchy of progress. So it begins to sort of uh, locate uh, societies or communities along this linear hierarchy where those on top are considered to be more civilized, whereas those in the bottom are considered to be more barbaric or primitive. Uh, and, and progress is measured along this kind of scale where uh, technological, uh, cultural uh, types of complexity is used as an indication that a society or community is therefore more civilized. And this has repercussion on how uh, non-Europeans and people who are colonized begin to see and, uh, uh, themselves and understand uh, themselves in relation to uh, modernity. So examples of this can be found in, for example, the Majala Guru, where there's an editorial in 1930 which clearly states that uh, uh, in order to become uh, a part of this modern world, uh, one needs to also have a museum. One needs to have this 
idea that uh, things that are old can be collected in museum so that it can be known to people in the present day that they can learn from those uh, material and con that can contribute to their idea of progressing and becoming modern human subjects. Of course, interestingly, present-day scholarship are also beginning to challenge, uh, you know, uh, the colonial account uh, that tend to uh, recognize only the, uh, the European uh, knowledge producers of these museums. Uh, so, for example, in Jennifer Morris's new research, uh, she explored also how a network of IBANs were really central players within uh, the formation of the Sarawak Museum, and not only in Sarawak itself, you know. Uh, so challenging the stereotype of IBANs as warriors and headhunters under the brute rule of Sarawak, uh, in fact, Morris's work in fact suggests that there was a network of IBANs who began to spread across Southeast Asia working as scientific collectors. And even if you look at reports from like the Taiping Museum or the Slango Museum, very often you find that there are a member of uh, staff who is of uh, Iban ethnic origin. So notable figures such as Ketit, Sajai Bulang, and Lajang Gadisang uh, originated from Saribas, uh, were noted to even have made his name all the way in Thailand and some even ventured all the way to the U.S., uh, uh, assisting in the transportation of animals and specimens to the National Museum over there. And in fact, um, you know, Google uh, most recently, I think last year, celebrated uh, uh, the Benedict Sandin's uh, 102nd uh, birthday, and he was the first uh, uh, indigenous uh, museum curator uh, uh, that was, uh, who was appointed as a curator of the Sarawak Museum. So uh, there are a lot of efforts coming from recent scholarship in trying to revise the history of a museum, talk about how network and what kind of uh, local agencies also participated in the museum's uh, uh, knowledge production. However, I think we have to be very careful also and critical of this um, the, uh, celebration of local agency just because they have a role to play within knowledge production in a museum because this participation very often opens uh, a person, uh, a non-European, to the risk of complicity in building up a racial realized knowledge. So for example, in this 1931 travelogue uh, where it describes how uh, upon viewing a diorama in the Raffles Museum, the author began to uh, 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 agree with, uh, you know, how the museum interpreted uh, the use of a particular type of metallic board band, which is claps onto uh, the head of a child, uh, and agreeing to the museum's, uh, you know, interpretation that this restricted you know, the intellectual growth of the Malays uh, as a result of, and therefore accounting for their slow, slowness to progress and modernize, uh, right? Uh, however, he interestingly attributes this to a custom and entertains the idea that by getting rid of the old habit, one might be able to change. Uh, then he doubted himself again and suggested that there are environmental factors such as the tropic could be wearing down this idea of human industry. Uh, so what this indicates is that uh, in such a setting, uh, when we think of these local agents, they're also playing the role of compradors, uh, meaning that they're almost like two, uh, they're almost like agents that have two faces, because this is part of this, what we call the colonial system of indirect rule. So you don't rule directly, you rule through locals who are selected to, uh, you know, uh, to institute uh, uh, all these sort of like systems on your behalf. Uh, so part of the colonial sort of like knowledge uh, uh, system is that uh, it, what it does is that local compradors very often replicate the logic of hierarchy of racial progress that is so central to European knowledge system. Yet 
in such an instance, you also detect what is interestingly moments of doubt. Uh, what it does show is that in such a figure like uh, Shi Bomo, he is also beginning to question himself. Uh, what it shows here, if we are trying to redeem him and not turn him into this cardboard figure, is that he essentially demonstrates that he's becoming a Socratic subject, one that is questioning uh, in a dialectical manner, using doubt productively to destabilize and even his own assumptions about how the things work, uh, even if ultimately he, uh, he he's, uh, still hasn't sort of like figured out clearly uh, 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 what is his actual sort of position when it comes to his view of the Malay people, right? Uh, but essentially, what it shows here is that there's this destabilizing moment uh, that you tend to sort of find in recollections, in voices of recollection. So how do we then try to amplify these moments of destabilizing and why are they important to think about? I think they are important to think about is because um, uh, it shows to us what the broader public sentiment is when it comes to uh, how knowledge from one particular system or one particular culture as it is received, uh, especially when there is an imbalance between uh, the two sort of like uh, uh, giving and receiving cultures. So, and to capture some of these voices, one perhaps must look to local references that points to that of a broader public not just those who participate within the curatorial discourse of the museum. Uh, so challenge is that, you know, sources of this nature are scum and that in different languages, uh, they are all in different languages. But I would argue that it is also only productive if we approach this through a multicultural lens, a multilingual lens. That means we need to acknowledge uh, the multilingual nature of these kinds of uh, local interpretive frames and to track conversations such as this allow us to think of how a broader public speak back to the universalism of European knowledge system. Perhaps in this case suggesting other forms of universalism, of seeing the world, of making sense of it also existed alongside that of the overdetermined meaning uh, uh, one that uh, comes out of Europe that comes through the curatorial voice of the museum. So from the 19th century onwards, I think there were already acknowledgement of institutions that promoted some form of memory practice. However, these terminologies were not always fixed, right? Uh, sometimes the word museum is used uh, or sometimes it's used at uh, tempat pertunjukan, for example. And in the Hikayat Abdullah uh, from 1849, it's called simply as Ruma Yang Menaruh Gambar Rupa Tuan Raffles. As if it is a kind of like memorial site uh, to commemorate a singular person. Then in also like the Singapore, uh, descriptive account of Singapore, uh, there is a uh, mention of uh, how, uh, uh, what you call a bo wu yuan. So this would become a standardized term later on in the Chinese language to describe what a museum is. So in the Malay language, however, the first uh, supposed mention of the word museum is in the form of this uh, word called ajaib kana. And scholars such as uh, Muhammad Taib Osman did suggest that the initial word for the mu word museum in the Malay language is Ajaib Kana. Uh, it comes from Arabic and more likely an Indo-Persian loan term. Kana here refers to a hall or a roof gathering venue, uh, a roof gathering venue, therefore suggesting that the museum was seen as a kind of hall of wonders, a hall of strange things. But actually, um, I haven't been entirely successful in finding other examples other than the one that Muhammad Tai Osman constantly used. And it more often or not actually refers uh, in the article that he often used as an example to how the public came to see an Ajayi Piana at the Chicago World's Expo. Uh, 
so this is the only instance that I uh, found it being used in the Malay language, meaning that there's a hall of wonder that was being erected at the Chicago World Expo in 1893. And this was uh, briefly mentioned in the Jawi Pranakan newspaper uh, of 1893 uh, itself. Uh, the word Ajayat Khanna really, I think, uh, came from India. Uh, so the famous example is the Ajayat uh, in, in what is now Pakistan today. Uh, and it took inspiration from uh, the Lahore Museum, uh, which in the, in the uh, it, it's called the Ajayat So, uh, So those of you who have uh, done English literature would know that uh, this was where John Lockwood Kipling uh, used to work as a curator and he was uh, the famous author Ruyat Kipling's father uh, uh, and, and Ruyat Kipling himself would have uh, written uh, a novel with him uh, that opens with, uh, uh, with uh, the museum as the main setting for the particular story. Okay. Uh, more common in the Malay world, I think, uh, rather than the Ajayat Khanna, which had its one or two mentioned, is the word Skola Gamba. So uh, I think that the term Ajayat Khanna was not widely used. Instead, from the 1980s onwards, at least, a more widely used term associated with the museum uh, was to connect the museum with pictures. So either as Rumah Gamba, or Tempat Tengok Gamba, or Skola Gamba. So its appearance in early 20th century really brings into question the conventional narrative that tends to identify Skola Gamba as a term that gained popularity only from the 1950s onwards. So in most scholarly accounts, it is described as a new cultural orientation for the museum from 1950s onwards, taking a more educational turn during, during the political transition of independence, right? But I feel that, you know, this term had an earlier uh, precedence and its earlier use was already indicating that, uh, uh, you know, such, uh, such ambition and, and, uh, of, of recognizing the museum as primarily picture-centered and also educational in nature uh, was already something that was common, uh, commonly used in the early 20th century. But that's also not exactly, uh, 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 you know, the neat timeline that uh, scholars like to build is that there's this shift in terms from Ajaipana to Skolagamba to museum uh, later on from this. Uh, so from the 19th century, it's Ajaipana, 1950s Skolagamba, and then from the 60s onwards, it became museum. But this is a very neat timeline. So already uh, so for example i take uh, you know shares and newspapers from the 1930s and uh, even the late 19th century you would also already get uh, instances where the word museum was being used in the early 20th century and it seems like both terms were widely accepted and understood to also mean museum uh, 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 and existed alongside words like scholar gamba. So what you have here are two interesting examples. From in 1933, it seems like the museum was already part of a travel itinerary. So these are sites that one must visit in order to learn about a particular culture. So the museum here sits alongside the park, uh, the zoo, uh, various shrines and monuments, as well as commercial districts. And these are important sites that one must visit uh, in order to get a sense of what cultural life in a particular country or a city is, was like. Uh, similarly, I think this type of observation was also already uh, in place uh, as exemplified by the a poem on the Sultan of Linga's travel uh, in the late 19th century. And here we see him going to Singapore where he made an obligatory visit also to the museum. Uh, however, uh, he didn't have very much to say about the museum uh, very quickly after visiting the museum as if it's done in a routine manner. 
uh, you know, it state that selesaikan Bali dari situ, berangkatlah pula sekaliannya itu. And therefore, he then went on to the kebun permainan, uh, where I think he uh, was able to uh, enjoy himself a lot more rather than or the stuffy things that he finds in the museum itself. So in these, uh, 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 trying to capture these local perceptions, we also get a much less rosy view of the museums as well as how the museum perhaps falls short in many ways of what it was set out to do and the ideals that it pur uh, purports to uh, promote amongst the local population. Uh, so, so far we've looked at mansions. So what happens if we find some kind of record that is perhaps more reflective in character? One example is this account by Huang Qiang. He's a Chinese general who was governing Hainan Island at that moment, visited Malaya around the end of June in 1626. So his daily observation was subsequently published in a two-volume travelogue uh, in 1928. And it's likely that only the first volume was published, right? Uh, so we have never encountered the second volume. So in chapter 53, he mentioned his visit to the Selangau Museum uh, here in KL, which was the museum that was erected uh, before on the, uh, on the site of where the Na Museum Negara sits on today, and it offered a very unique non-European perspective. So what he did was he noted the prominence of the elephant display, elephant skeleton that was this uh, taxidermy that was displayed at the entrance, uh, behind which are the trees, uh, in which a model of a warship is featured with the word Malaya written on it and a torpedo. Then he spent some time actually explaining the ship's significance attributing it to the fundraising efforts of Malayans during World War I, and he noted how popular the warship model was as a museum display, attracting visitors from all corners of the country. Hong Chang was perhaps less impressed by the other sections featuring plants and animals, because primarily the Selangau Museum was a natural history museum, uh, but there was a section on mining covering uh, gold, tin, and coal mining, and featuring different methods and technologies of mining with uh, specifically unique Nanyang examples being featured. Oh, that's what he said. Yeah? But uh, what Fan Chang noted was that the, form the information was extensive and educational. But here, he wished that the uh, machines could be demonstrated since these were just uh, a rather uh, past, uh, inert, miniaturized model that's not dynamic. He suggested there could be someone there to either demonstrate how these things could be operated. And what it suggests here is that, at least from a European perspective, the museum was fascinating not as a repository of old artifacts, but also as a repository of uh, showcasing modern technology and innovation. And that for some people, this was held out great fascination more than things that are old. So in some ways, paying attention to how museums are named themselves uh, actually gives us an idea of what are the priorities that compel their establishment in cultures that never had a historical tradition of um, creating museums in the first place, right? Uh, so, uh, for example, the Royal Museum in, uh, in Bangkok, the museum really began as a Royal Museum in the Concordia Pavilion, a part of the Royal Complex, during the reign of King Rama V in 1874. So this is Chula, King Chula Longkorn, uh, who, uh, you know, was uh, fascinated by, uh, you know, all things European and began to explore exhibit the royal collections of his, the former king, King Rama the Fourth, uh, King Mongkut, uh, 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 alongside other objects of general interest. So this exhibition really was a temporary one, uh, but became a an regular annual affair during the king's birthday celebration all the way until 1887. That year, uh, the front palace was carved out, uh, and this used to be a palace that belonged to the prince successor uh, and Thai Siam back then, uh, or Thailand back then, it's called Siam, used to have a system where there was two kings. And so there was the front king, uh, who's almost like uh, 
playing a secondary role and the real king who sits behind, right? And so this has been uh, subsequently demolished and so the palace itself uh, was uh, taken and used as a permanent museum called the Royal Museum at Wang Na. Uh, and uh, in building this uh, Royal Museum, the word used was Pipitapan, uh, Satan. And over time, it came to mean a place for storing and displaying manifold objects of rarity. However, because it is so closely connected to um, royal demonstration of, of its uh, generosity, uh, uh, the museum therefore became a tool uh, and acquired certain kind sense of aura that is connected also to the palace and the palace as a, a front-facing uh, uh, kind of uh, the museum as a palace front-facing institution to demonstrate royal power through its storing and displaying of uh, objects of rarity. Right? Uh, so it's almost as if a, you're using all these sort of like antiquated objects uh, to accrue certain kind of uh, power, certain kind of samangat or certain kind of mana. Uh, and in the Thai context, this is called barami. Uh, uh, it's a type of power that uh, uh, the, uh, someone with royal privilege and prerogative is able to express uh, itself and therefore uh, uh, it legitimizes also his or her rule and his or her actions. Uh, as, even as these actions might not make sense to the common people. Okay. Uh, so how, what other perspectives can we sort of like draw on in the museum? Let's look at uh, the, this other account. And this is the story of Masutama, probably a Japanese uh, small, what is called a Wong Chile, a small person, a little man. Uh, however, his voice was recorded in a short story of his visit to the museum, uh, found in a textbook used by the Dutch government to teach the Malay language. And uh, it, here he provides a vivid description of what he saw, you know, as he entered the museum, uh, starting with the archaeological sculpture. So the lo for the locals, uh, the museum in Batavia was known by two names. First, it was known as the Gedong Gaja, for the elephant statue uh, that was sited in front of the museum and gifted by King Chula Longkorn himself uh, during his visit to Batavia. And the second name is for the museum is called the Gedong Archa, or the Hall of Sculpture. And this was primarily in reference to all the archaeological uh, excavations that were on display as you enter the museum. Today, the museum still preserves many of its original display, and therefore it's actually worth going and have a look at how uh, magnificent this kind of like display is as a type of assembly of old objects. It certainly gives off certain kind of aura. Uh, so as our friend uh, walked through the museum, he had the chance to meet the curator who he translates the title as Tuan Yang Kuasa di Gedung Itu, the master who possesses power over the hall. And he spoke of the curator sitting in an office filled with all the jewels of the now vanquished kingdom with almost a tinge of sadness, you know. Uh, you know, di dalam bilik yang dengan, dengan, yang penuh dengan barang pusaka raja-raja di Hindia dari zaman dahulu. And he also dwelt on the model of display, the mode of display. Maka barang pusaka itu setengahnya ditaruh dalam almari yang rata dan panjang bertutupan glass, setengahnya ditaruh dalam almari yang berdiri. And then list down where all the things came from. Banjamasin, Jawa, Aceh, Bengkulu, and the list went on and on and on. And finally, after spending a long time looking at many things in the museum, he addressed himself as a hamba to convey his modesty as he concludes his story by returning to his small little hut. Right. Uh, uh, and that ends the story, you know. He went back to Ulang ke Pondok Hamba. He returns to his small little hut. So let's take for a moment to think about the contradiction of scale that we're seeing here. The flimsy ramshackle hut against the sturdy brick edifice of the museum. 
And for a long time, we've been saying that the cost of having a museum that might contain such an encyclopedic collection of things such as that which Ma Sutama had seen uh, really came with a price, that of violence and the tragic price of colonialism. And this resulted in the subjugation of one's sovereign people and not just uh, a, a single group or many, many different groups. Well, this cannot be disputed. Uh, I think proponents of decolonization of the museum uh, sometimes adopt a very innocent view that the goal of decolonizing is simply about returning the objects meaning to its original context and addressing the violence of this past. Right? But I think uh, in reading the museum as being overdetermined by a singular colonial agenda, we often turn our ears and eyes away from the stories that have survived, such as that of Masutama. For ultimately, what did Masutama himself see? He not only saw destruction or despair, he saw a space that was able to stitch together all these different kingdoms that has been vanquished. And from this, we turn back to Harrison's um, idea of the museum as a two-way breathing in and out affair, in which he explains that only a museum and library can you enter and wander freely anyway and all day. And in the process, each section of the community should find out more about others. And in, in Harrison's case, he said, not only find out more about others, but about Sarawak as a whole. Right, uh, and this was his uh, uh, 1947 uh, uh, article in the Sarawak Gazette. Similarly, I think Masatama was wondering, doesn't come to any conclusion. We are invited, however, to dwell on the possibilities that have opened up before his eye as the world that will in the future become an independent Indonesia, a nation that can accommodate all the different peoples from across the Nusantara archipelago was also, in a sense, slowly coming into view. And that is why the museum exists in this very strange paradox that is, uh, on the one hand, imposing and overdetermining in terms of the meaning that it tries to produce uh, is one that is singularly European and colonial, yet at the same time, it is also a an institution that is unstable, that contains a, 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 the seed of its own sort of like destabilization, uh, whereby uh, in, in the way it sort of like bring things together, it also offers new imagination for uh, uh, that seed that the ideas of new nations that are to come in the future.